Here we're going to look at a nice little number theory type problem. So our goal is to find natural numbers x, and so by natural numbers I mean positive integers, such that 8x cubed minus 20 and 2x to the fifth minus 2 are both perfect squares. And kind of built into this is that they are perfect squares of integers or natural numbers, but those are the same kind of. Okay, before we get into a solution, I've got a hint for you guys if you want to try it. And the hint is to build an inequality that will show that there are no such solutions after a point and then test the individual cases before that point. Okay, so if you want to give this problem a go with that hint, go ahead and do it, and then we'll come back with a solution. Okay, hopefully that hint was helpful. Now we're ready to look at a solution. So since we want to find these x values where these two quantities are perfect squares, let's go ahead and introduce some more notation. So let's say that this one is the perfect square, which is m squared, and this one is the perfect square, n squared. So m and n are the natural numbers that build this perfect square relationship. Okay, now next what we want to do is multiply m squared and n squared, and thus that's the same thing as multiplying these left-hand sides. So let's see what that gives us. We'll have m squared n squared, so that's going to be the same thing as 8x cubed minus 20 times 2x to the fifth minus 2. Okay, good. Now what we'll do is just multiply that out, so that's fairly straightforward. We'll have 16x to the eighth, so that'll be the 8x cubed times the 2x to the fifth. Then let's maybe do this in decreasing order of the exponents. So maybe we'll do 2x to the fifth times negative 20, so that'll be minus 40x to the fifth, like that. And then maybe next we should do 8x cubed times negative 2. So that's going to be minus 16x cubed. And then finally we have plus 40. And now here comes a really tricky step. So we want to express this m squared times n squared as a perfect square plus or minus some other term. And then the next perfect square plus or minus something. So notice that that's going to have to involve this top term, or that most likely involves this top term, which if you look at the square root of this top term, that's going to be 4x to the fourth. So I think maybe the trick here is just to play around with it. And what you'll land on are these two following expressions. So this is going to be equal to 4x to the fourth minus 5x quantity squared. But then obviously we've introduced some terms that are not up here, and we have not used all of the terms up here. And so in order to make that correction, we'll have the following stuff. So this is going to be minus 16x cubed, and then plus 25x squared minus 40, like that. Okay, good. And then the other way that we want to express this is as the perfect square right below this one. In other words, as 4x to the fourth minus 5x minus 1 squared. And then we're going to have something else there um, just to correct it so that it's exactly equal to this. And what we will have is the following. So this is going to be 8x to the fourth and then minus 16x cubed minus 25x squared, and then finally minus 10x and minus 39. So we've got this way of expressing, expressing our m squared times n squared as a perfect square and the previous perfect square with some correction factors. So if we can show something about an inequality involving these correction factors, like if maybe we can find an x where they're both positive, then we can set up a scenario where m times n lies exactly between two natural numbers, which means that we don't have those types of m times n's. There are no natural numbers in between two consecutive natural numbers. That's kind of well known. So in other words, what we want to do now is claim the following two things. So I'm going to set this equal to f of x, and I'll set this equal to g of x. And the claim is that for x bigger than or equal to 4, we have 
f of x is bigger than or equal to zero and g of x is bigger than or equal to zero. That means we can control exactly what we're subtracting or adding. So if we drop off this subtraction, we know that we've created something larger. If we drop off this addition, we know that we've created something smaller. So let's maybe look at this proof one function at a time. So let's first look at f of x. And this f of x is actually maybe the easiest. And so what you can do is check that f evaluated at four. Well, that's most definitely positive. So you can just plug in four and do the arithmetic and see that you get 1384, which is clearly a positive number. The next will show that it's increasing for all x bigger than four or bigger than or equal to four. And we'll do that by showing that the derivative is positive. So let's maybe do that, show f increasing. So let's take the derivative of f. So that's gonna give us, let's see, 48x squared plus 50x. Notice the derivative of the negative 40, that's gonna go to zero. But notice that this thing is bigger than zero as long as x is bigger than zero. Well, if x is bigger than four, as we're assuming here, then it's definitely bigger than zero. So in other words, we have the derivative is positive, which means it's increasing everywhere after four. It's positive at four. And so that tells us that yes, we know that f of x has to be positive if x is bigger than or equal to four. Okay, now let's get rid of this little proof right here and then we'll do the same thing for g of x. Okay, we just finished showing that f of x was bigger than or equal to zero. Now we're gonna show that this function g of x is also bigger than or equal to zero for x bigger than or equal to four. And this is a little bit trickier. So how I'm gonna do it goes like this. I'm going to say that this is equal to eight x to the fourth minus 16 x cubed minus 25 x squared minus 10 x minus 39, like that. And next what I'll do is I'll replace these guys with maybe some numbers that work better with our leading term so that we can turn this into something that's a little bit easier to work with. So what I'll do is I'll say that this is bigger than or equal to 8x to the fourth and then I'll leave that as 16x cubed and then I'll increase that to negative 32x squared but if I increase that and I'm subtracting it, then that means it's um, going to decrease the whole thing. That's gonna go to 16. So we've got 16x, and then finally this is gonna be minus 39. Now what we can do is factor an 8x out of the first bit. So let's do that. So this is gonna be equal to 8x, and then we have x cubed minus 2x squared minus 4x minus 2. And then finally, outside of that parentheses, we have minus 39. Okay, and now we're gonna look at this little function here and notice that maybe we'll call this h of x. And the first thing that we wanna notice is that h evaluated at four, so we can check that and that's equal to 22. So this is equal to 22, which is positive. But then if we plug 22 in here and eight times four here, we'll get something bigger than 39. So that makes the whole thing positive. So we're good to go at four. And then we'll show that this function h of x is increasing. But if h of x is increasing, that's gonna make the whole thing increasing. And we'll do that again with the derivative. So let's look at h prime of x. So h prime of x, that'll be three x squared and the next we'll have minus four x minus four. And then we can pretty easily factor that. So that factors like x minus two and then three x plus two. But notice that's equal to zero at x equals minus two thirds and x equals two. But thinking about the shape of a parabola, so this thing goes like that. We notice that we've got a root here at two and then it's going to be positive everywhere to the right of two. So here we can say that this is bigger than zero if x is bigger than two. But that means that this thing is getting bigger, but this thing was big enough to counteract that minus 39 even when we were at four, but it's only getting bigger, which means that we always have this thing is strictly bigger than zero. Okay, good. 
So now let's maybe go ahead and get rid of this and then we'll finish it off. So in the last board we wrote m squared times n squared where that was the product of these two expressions in terms of consecutive perfect squares. So on one hand, we wrote it as 4x squared minus 5x minus 1 quantity squared plus g of x, where g of x was some function that we derived. And then on the other hand, we wrote it as 4x to the fourth minus 5x squared minus f of x, where that was another function that we derived. Then next, we showed that as long as x was bigger than or equal to 4, we had f and g were both positive. But that means if we drop the subtraction of f, we get something that is strictly bigger. And if we drop the addition of g, we get something that is strictly smaller. So that sets up a really important inequality. So notice that we've got 4x to the fourth minus 5x minus 1 squared is strictly less than m squared times n squared which is strictly less than 4x to the fourth minus 5x squared. So what we found is a perfect square lying in between two consecutive perfect squares, which is obviously impossible. But we can see that it's impossible a little bit more easily by taking the square root of this inequality that I've underlined in red. So that's gonna give us 4x to the fourth minus 5x minus one is less than mn, which is less than 4x to the fourth minus 5x. Now notice, since we're assuming that x is a natural number, we know here that this is a natural number, this is a natural number, and this is a natural number. But that tells us we have a natural number which is strictly in between two consecutive natural numbers but that's a contradiction, that is impossible. So here we have an, a contradiction which tells us that x bigger than or equal to four does not give us any solution to our problem. So that means we just need to check cases. So we need the case when x is equal to one, x is equal to two, and then finally when x is equal to three. Because again, we're just looking for natural number solutions here. Okay, so let's see what we get for x equal to one. So we'll plug x equal to 1 into here. Notice that's going to give us 8 minus 20. So that'll be minus 16, but that's less than 0. But since minus 16 is less than 0, that's not a perfect square. So we have no solution in this case. Interestingly, if you plug x equal to 1 in here, you'll get 0. So it's like you almost get a solution if you were to involve imaginary numbers here. Notice this would be like 4i squared, and then the other one would be 0 squared. So this is almost a solution. Now let's plug in x equals 2. So maybe we'll plug x equals 2 in here, and that's going to give us 8 times 2 cubed. So that's 8 times 8 minus 20. So that's 64 minus 20, which is equal to 44, but that's not a perfect square either. So no solution in this case either. Okay, so that just leaves us with one thing to check, and that is x equals 3. So let's see what we get when we plug in x equals 3. So here we'll have 8 times 27 minus 20. And then it's just routine arithmetic to check that that's equal to 14 squared. So we're off to a good start. And then we can look at the next bit. So maybe two times three to the fifth, which is like 243 minus two. And you can see that that is equal to 22 squared. Meaning that in fact, in this setting, when X is equal to three, we get a perfect square for both of these objects. And that's a good place to stop.